start. Um, welcome everyone, good uh, afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Edward James, I'm the Director of Content Analysis at Mead Projects, and I'll be uh, hosting the uh, webinar today, uh, where we're looking at the massive, massive $900 billion uh, development plan in Saudi Arabia, the, the country which is on everyone's lips, which everyone is talking about at the moment, uh, uh, where there's a, a vast number and value of, of, of projects uh, and uh, project programs currently underway. Uh, I'm delighted to have with us today um, two experts um, from global real estate consulting firm um, practice, Knight Frank, uh, Faisal Durrani, and Kava Samsami, and they will be um, joining me on the panel uh, in, in a bit, where we have, I'll ask, be asking some questions. But most importantly, this session is interactive, and it's an opportunity for you, the audience, uh, to take the opportunity to ask questions of um, of uh, Faisal and Kaveh, uh, as well as myself, and um, uh, to take that opportunity to, to ask any questions you want about the Saudi projects market, particularly on the real estate uh, and commercial office uh, developments underway currently in the kingdom. But before we start that panel, um, I'll be giving a quick, quick overview of the projects market and project developments in the kingdom, uh, take about 15 minutes or so, putting into context everything that's currently happening in the kingdom uh, before we move on to some more specific questions around the real estate market uh, in Saudi. So let's, without further ado, let's uh, move on. So first of all, uh, just a little bit about Mead, Mead Projects. So Mead Projects is an online projects tracking service covering all major projects in the Mead and Africa regions. And it's by tracking projects uh, across different geographies and sectors that we're able to quantify trends, opportunities and challenges in each market. And the, the, the bulk of the data that you'll see today in this presentation is sourced from Mead Projects. If you want to know a little bit more, please feel free to visit our website, www.meadprojects.com. Okay, so let's uh, kick off looking at this, uh, looking at a macro level view of the Saudi Arabia projects market. And let's start by putting it into context of the other uh, projects market in the GCC uh, region. So um, we can see here uh, that Saudi Arabia uh, has historically been one, either the largest or the second largest project market in the GCC. Um, in the last normal year, i.e. pre-pandemic year, i.e. 2019, Saudi Arabia was by far and away the largest single project market in the region. Um, perhaps no surprise there, it has the largest population, it's also got the largest economy. Uh, and in 2019, you can see that close to $50 billion worth of contracts were awarded in the kingdom. Next up was then the UAE, just over 30 billion, and then Qatar, Oman, Kuwait, and Bahrain. Uh, of course, last year was a very difficult year, the pandemic, uh, exceptional economic circumstances, oil price fell, uh, a lot of projects were delayed, and unsurprisingly, uh, a lot of uh, project spending declined quite considerably uh, in 2020. And you can see that in Saudi Arabia, project spending last year was a little over $20 billion. That, however, still made it the largest projects market in the region, and, uh, and it's actually when we are looking ahead looking at the project pipeline of the projects to come uh, where we get, can get really excited. And I'll be showing you a little bit uh, about that data uh, coming up towards the end of this webinar. Now, in terms of actual project spending in the kingdom, uh, where is uh, the bulk of spending going on projects? Uh, and again, not, uh, not a total surprise when we look at this list. Um, the largest recipient of project spending is the Eastern province. That's the main oil and gas producing region of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and of course, Saudi Arabia is the world's largest energy exporter. So uh, not surprising that over the last decade, uh, it's been the leading uh, destination of project investment, more than $100 billion. Uh, but next up are definitely not so, so much oil and gas orientated, and that's uh, the Riyadh province where the capital is located, uh, which has seen more than $90 billion of contracts awarded over the last 90 years, uh, last 10 years, sorry, primarily in, um, transport sector, particularly metro road projects, but also uh, very importantly in real estate, in uh, commercial office space and housing. We then have Mecca province, which also houses Jeddah, second city, 
uh, uh, which has seen close to $80 billion of contracts awarded in the last decade, again, primarily in real estate, transport. Then Jizan in the far south, which has seen is a growing industrial hub, then followed by Medina Tabuk, where Neom is, uh, the northern borders provinces and other parts of the kingdom. Before I go on, just a reminder, if you've got any questions about this or about the real estate market and uh, program project program developments at all in, in, in Saudi Arabia, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box, which you should see in the menu, and uh, we'll get, hopefully get a chance to answer those later. Now, let's take that same data for the last decade and take a look at it, at how the spending has been made by on a, on a sectoral basis. Where has that spending been made? So you can see here that actually uh, the construction sector, that is houses, housing, real estate in general, malls, uh, hospitals, universities, schools, high rises, villas, you name it, is the single largest sector in Saudi Arabia. And not just in Saudi Arabia, but the GCC as a whole. We've seen close to $140 billion worth of um, construction spend over the last decade, uh, which makes it by far and away the largest single sector uh, in the kingdom. Next up, we've got transport at close, at close to $80 billion over the last decade. Transport covers roads, ports, airports, seaports, railways and metros and so on. And has been a clear um, sector or uh, target sector from the government over the last decade. Then power, of course, uh, at nearly $50 billion. Uh, that's substations, transmission, distribution, but also uh, gas power plants, renewable energy, and so on. Then gas and oil, which combined are more than $80 billion. Um, that's obviously upstream, downstream, midstream. Investment, and then industrial water and petrochemicals uh, rounding up the rest. What are some of the uh, largest contracts awarded uh, in the last 10 years? Well, um, you can see here a few, a few of them. We've got the aforementioned um, Riyadh Metro projects, uh, lines one and two, then package for four, five, and six, and last package for line three. More, uh, close to $20 billion of contracts awarded on the Riyadh Metro, which is nearing completion and which will have uh, an interesting dynamic on the uh, real estate market in the capital. We also saw the Haramein high-speed rail network linking uh, Jeddah, Mecca, Rabig, and Medina as well, which is the first high-speed railway network in the region. We also got a range of other projects across different sectors. We've got power plants. We've got massive Abraj Kudai hotel complex. Uh, we've got um, oil and gas projects, of course, as well. Um, we've got a range of different projects across different sectors. Uh, which is one of the reasons why Saudi Arabia is so interesting for many companies, it's because it offers uh, projects across different markets, different sectors. So there's something for everyone. Now, taking a look at who the, are the companies implementing some of these huge uh, projects. Well, we've got, again, we've got a range of companies from across different sectors, but also across different nationalities as well. Sure, we've got Saudi companies like Nesma, Saudi Bin Laden Group, EBB Rock, uh, Al Rashi Trading Contracting. We also got many international companies operating in the kingdom, like Saipem, Technicast, well, you know that's McDermott, Larson, Tubro, Senior Hydro, Samsung, and so on. Uh, and that again just underlines how attractive the Saudi Arabia market is for international companies, because it is open for anyone to come in and do business. And whether you're a consultant, whether you're a contractor, uh, whether you're a supplier, uh, there are opportunities abound in the kingdom. And that's reflected here uh, in this list of top contractors. Okay, so that's the last 10 years. Let's look at some of the current opportunities. What are some of the big projects currently uh, out to, to, to bid in the kingdom? Well, there are more than $15 billion of active projects in tender at the moment in the kingdom, which obviously bodes very well for the short term got, again, a range of different projects across different sectors. We've got power plants, uh, defense projects, uh, major highways, we've got petrochemical plants, wind farms, uh, we've got uh, hospitals, uh, housing uh, developments. So we've got a range of, of, many, of, very, of many very large significant projects currently out in the market. Um, which has got everyone excited, which everyone is looking at currently. And this is just the beginning. This is just the very, very short term. 
when we look longer term, as we will in the next couple of slides, then the, the number it grows and becomes even uh, more significant. But again, as you can see from this slide, a lot of projects across different sectors, uh, which is one of the reasons why Saudi Arabia is so attractive to companies. Longer term, again, some of the flavor, the flavor of some of the big future projects. We've got nuclear power program. We've got a major new city project called Dahiyat al Fursan uh, near uh, Mecca. We've got uh, the Riyadh Dhamam high speed railway project. Uh, we've got the Jeddah to Riyadh uh, Saudi land bridge project. We've got Faisalia city. Uh, we've got a metro project in Daman in the eastern province. We've got, of course, the Giga projects like the Red Sea tourism project. Um, and uh, got power plants and other affordable housing projects and so on. Again, a large number of projects across uh, different sectors. And this is just a small uh, sample of those significant projects going forward. So all told, uh, close to $1.2 trillion worth of known, planned, and unawarded projects in the kingdom. That's by far the largest pipeline of projects of any country uh, in the MENA region, and in fact, one of the largest pipeline of projects of any country uh, anywhere globally. Uh, now, of that $1.2 trillion, the vast majority, nearly three quarters, is in the construction segment, uh, nearly um, $900 billion in construction, uh, which has it's historically the largest sector, and going forward, it's the largest sector as well. Then got transport, $106 billion. We've got um, Oil and gas, of course, water projects as well, uh, but it really is dominated by real estate and that, that investment in construction. What are some of the large future clients uh, in the kingdom? Well, we've got uh, the nuclear energy program, we've got Saudi Aramco, of course, which is the big oil and gas producer. We've got the Ministry of Housing, which is busily busy building uh, half a million uh, units uh, for local nationals. Uh, we've got the Royal Commission for Riyadh City, which is ha handling a number of major projects in Riyadh, Saudi Railway Company, the Royal Commission for Al Ula, uh, Saudi Electricity Company, and so on. And we've got the big Giga project clients like the Red Sea Development Company, of course. We've got Diria Gate Development Authority, and uh, we've got Neon, and so on. And now, just a look, closer look to end with just a closer look at some of the key projects going forward. Well, here's one of them, which is, the, which is under the Royal Commission for Riyadh City. This is Green Riyadh, which is a $22 billion uh, program to transform Riyadh into uh, a more aesthetically pleasing place to live, parks, uh, huge tree planting program, uh, boulevards, museums, uh, outside attractions, uh, and so on. And uh, this is now well underway. The infrastructure is already being uh, built uh, across several different uh, parts of Riyadh, and it really is going to transform uh, Riyadh uh, and the kingdom as a whole. And uh, this is, again, a really exciting project. It's rapidly underway. Um, again, just a reminder before I move on, just to submit your questions in the Q&A box. If you've got any questions uh, for either myself or our panel today, uh, please um, and please feel free to submit. Another key project, really interesting, um, that's uh, coming up, uh, which is the Royal Commission for Al Ula. This is a major um, touristic development, touristic and cultural development in the uh, northwest of the kingdom. Uh, it's being implemented alongside with the French cultural authorities to develop a new tourism a resort and cultural program there. Uh, this is uh, a, a multi-billion dollar project that's certainly going to uh, transform the, uh, the, the, the area and the market in the kingdom. Just one of several tourism developments in the uh, kingdom. Another project which is already well underway, which is going to transform uh, the Riyadh, which is the area gate development, the western side of Riyadh. This is a massive new uh, culturally sensitive uh, construction program involved in the construction of high-end residential units, retail and, and leisure facilities on the UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site on the western side of uh, Riyadh. Uh, multi-billion dollar program. A lot of it's gonna be built underground in order to keep it up, in, keep, in order to keep it um, uh, in keeping with the historic nature and character of uh, the area. Again, as you can see from the bottom right, lots of projects already underway. 
And another key project in the kingdom um, is a project you might well have heard of recently, which is the King Salman International Park. Uh, it's going to be the world's biggest park. Again, we'll transform Riyadh as a place to live and work, uh, involving um, massive investment in new residential units, hotels, uh, tourism, uh, retail space. And again, this is already underway. It involves the dismantling of the existing airbase in this part of the city. Uh, and on the area where that's the airbase was, we're going to build this massive new uh, park development. So that just gives you an idea of some of the uh, key uh, projects, some facts and figures uh, about the, uh, the trends in the kingdom, the exciting pipeline of projects, what some of those projects are. Uh, as you can tell, uh, with such a large pipeline of more than of close to $1.2 trillion, there are, are a lot of developments, a lot of changes happening in the real estate sector segment uh, and the commercial segment in Saudi Arabia. And uh, to talk through uh, some of those uh, developments uh, in the kingdom, uh, we're delighted to have with us today uh, two partners at uh, global uh, real estate consulting firm, Knight Frank, uh, who are, will be here to take some questions. Um, I'm delighted to have with us uh, Faisal Durrani, who's uh, head of Middle East research at Knight Frank. Faisal is the, uh, has a more than 15 years of real estate experience, both uh, in the region and in the UK, where he was head of London commercial research at Knight Frank. Um, and he has led teams uh, providing consulting and strategic advisory services to a range of global clientele, including investors, landlords, developers, high net worth individuals, banks, and institutions. His knowledge and experience spans uh, all real sectors and includes key markets across the Middle East and Africa. And is a well-known commentator in the media and speaker at events. Um, he's already done some several key projects uh, this year, I believe, uh, Faisal, including uh, working within Saudi Arabia on the uh, impact of the vision 2030 um, and uh, the long-term vision for the kingdom and uh, what that means for the real estate market there. And also, he's also been looking at the rebounding Dubai uh, real estate sector, which has um, Come, emerged out of the pandemic in a, in a very different state than when it went in. Um, and alongside uh, Faisal uh, is Kabe Samsami, who is the uh, partner and development management uh, partner at uh, Knight Frank in Saudi Arabia itself. Uh, Kabe is uh, responsible for leading the development management service line um, and has delivered uh, more than $600 billion dollars uh, of, uh, of projects in, uh, uh, for blue real chip real estate developers in very, across the GCC. He has extensive knowledge in master plan and mixed use communities, high density residential developments and greenfield residential villa community uh, projects. Uh, he's been here a long time, since uh, 2006, so knows the region well, and um, has been involved in a number of large scale mixed use projects with leading real estate developers and government authorities, many of which I suspect were highlighted today uh, during the presentation. In fact, uh, I think some of the projects you've delivered, um, Kaaba include Min al Arab in Ras al uh, Dia Dia Maharak in, in Manama in Bahrain, and Ras Lafan Industrial City in Qatar. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. It's, uh, it's a real honor to have you with us. Um, I'd just like to ask uh, the chat and the audience with us today to um, submit any questions you have for Faisal or Kaaba in the Q&A box uh, regarding the uh, real estate market in Saudi Arabia and the development program there. And um, we have a chance to ask those questions to the audience, uh, to the panelists, to, to panelists um, in, a, in, a, in a moment. But first off, I've got a couple of questions, uh, Faisal and Carla. Um, can you just, Faisal, perhaps just to start off with, um, maybe just summarize, sum up the state of the, um, the uh, residential market in Saudi Arabia. I mean, what's, what, what's the current situation with it? How's it emerged from the pandemic? Uh, how have you coped with it? And um, what's driving um, development at the moment in, in, the, in the sector? Sure, uh, thanks Ed and good afternoon everyone. I think um, Ed, you're, you made an interesting point earlier about the impact of the pandemic. I, th I don't think we can overlook that. Um, and just before I answer your question, I think I just wanna uh, give us some context on, on how Saudi has fared through the uh, through the course of the pandemic. 
I mean, when it comes to, you know, the vaccine rollout, two thirds of the eligible population has had a dose um, and, and the country has essentially managed to contain the pandemic very effectively. In fact, uh, the WHO released a report a couple of weeks ago and singled out the GCC states for the way in which they've handled um, the pandemic. And that, of course, has, has played a big part in boosting business confidence levels. Um, if you look at the latest PMI readings for the non-oil sector in Saudi, we've had uh, 14 consecutive months uh, where it has been in positive uh, territory, i.e. businesses have been expanding and recruiting. Um, and actually, if you look at what happened to employment levels in Saudi throughout 2020, the country fared far better than some of its regional peers. Um, according to the data we've been looking at, employment dropped by a marginal 0.3% across the kingdom in 2020, compared to something like a five or 10% fall across nearby UAE. Um, and even when it comes to foreign direct investment, you know, against all odds, Saudi managed to draw in about $5 billion worth of foreign direct investment. It was only a 4% increase on 2019, but when you think about the fact that globally, foreign direct investment volumes collapsed by 42%, in 2020, that's a pretty remarkable uh, outcome and a testament to Vision 2030 and the impact that that has had on the economy and the real estate market in general. Um, when it comes to uh, the residential sector, um, you know, it's not off a word that we use very often on, on uh, when we're talking about real estate markets and research, but the residential market is booming. Um, at the moment, uh, you know, year on year in somewhere like Riyadh, apartment prices are up about 8%. Um, in Jeddah, apartment prices are up about 6%. Um, and this is being driven uh, by, by a number of factors, but most of them are linked to the National Transformation Plan and Vision 2030. Um, the first one that I probably want to highlight is, um, is Program HQ, uh, which is designed to get companies from around the region to headquarter out of King Abdullah Financial District. Um, you know, it's gonna be a long drawn process, but for the time being, we've got a couple of examples. Al Arabiya has announced that they're gonna shift their regional HQ from Dubai to Riyadh. That in turn is gonna create demand for residential property. Uh, we've also got a vast number of new government entities that have been created as a result of Vision 2030. Most of those new jobs are coming in Riyadh. Um, and again, that is creating fresh demand for, for housing. Uh, we've got a surge in the number of business investment licenses uh, that are being issued across the country. Last year, we had 1,400. That compares to about 700 uh, uh, five years prior. And in the first quarter of this year, we had about 500 new business licenses issued. And these are companies new to Saudi that are establishing themselves, that are being drawn in by the vast plans being announced. And then finally, um, you know, as, as part of Vision 2030, we know that one of the core pillars is to provide access to world-class housing for Saudi citizens. And that is driving up home ownership rates through programs such as Wafi and Sukhani. Home ownership rates currently sit at about 62, 63%. And by the end of the decade, that's expected to hit 70%. And as we saw from your, uh, your great slide pack there, that means we've got an exceptionally uh, active development pipeline. In Riyadh alone, we're expecting about 100,000 new units to be completed in the next three years. By the end of the decade, it's about half a million new residential units. And for context, Dubai today has 600,000 completed residential units. So we're looking at creating a city the size of Dubai in Riyadh in the next nine years. So some pretty, pretty big changes to come. Wow, yeah, that's uh, quite astonishing numbers you said there. And I'm, you know, particularly, uh, you know, positive is the fact that just how well Saudi Arabia performed last year when not many, not many countries around the world can say that they performed like, like, like that. Uh, I cover, we were talking earlier um, about how uh, Saudi Arabia is compar comparing very well with, with its neighbours and other, other, other countries uh, in, with regards to uh, its, uh, its not just the key me macro metrics like foreign investment and so on, but also in the real estate sector. I mean, um, we saw, Faisal just mentioned quite, quite strong uh, price growth. How, how does how does Saudi Arabia compare with 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 its neighbors in the GCC? Yeah, thank you very much, Ed. Just a quick one. Uh, you added a couple zeros to my profile. It's six billion, not six hundred. So uh, <laughs> for those that, uh, probably wondering, sorry about that. Billion, the whole world. No, it's okay. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, I think the, the the critical thing to understand about the, the Saudi development market is that it's the latest player to the game, right? I mean, UAE started obviously back uh, in the early 2000s, freehold property laws, uh, you know, massive government investment uh, into infrastructure, uh, you know, new metro system, road projects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Bahrain historically has been uh, sort of the, the, the sleeping giant, but they, they, they do have, relative to their market size, a decent amount of development. Oman also played around with some large-scale developments back in the early 2000s. Saudi Arabia completely missed that boat. I mean, just completely missed the boat. And now they're trying to play catch-up. The other issue is that, you know, Saudi Arabia has a significant difference from the rest of the GCC in that the population is primarily indigenous. So if you take a look at the percentage of uh, UAE nationals within the UAE, it's, it's something under 15%, maybe under 10%. Qatar, same thing, for example. Uh, Saudi Arabia, the vast majority of the population are Saudi nationals. And so what this means is that as opposed to a place like Dubai, where the primary driver for residential demand was and remains expatriates, as what, and expatriates meaning expatriates that live here like myself, Faisal, but also uh, foreign investors, uh, that are primarily, uh, you know, from uh, outside the region. Saudi Arabia, the drive actually is to build housing for the indigenous population. Now, this creates a couple fairly large differences in, in how the development process works. The first is that uh, extremely high percentage of the housing required in Saudi Arabia is affordable housing, right? Because the population dynamic there, you have a significant portion of, of low-income Saudis, uh, which which you, you don't have in the UAE, for example, or Qatar or Oman. Uh, the other difference is that you have uh, a propensity towards the primary home product typology as opposed to a second home, vacation home, investment product, branded residence, service department, which are very popular in Dubai, for example, because, again, the primary buyer market is either foreign investors or, or potentially people that don't live here full, you know, full time or year round. So these two dynamics creates a situation where the way that Saudi is sort of developing uh, uh, is is very different from how, how Dubai was developing. Yet still, they are trying to learn from the lessons of Dubai and the other you know countries that are ahead of them. And some of those lessons are applicable, and some of them, frankly, are not applicable because the market dynamic there uh, is so different, primarily because of these two issues. Uh, yeah, and I mean, and, and I, I, from my my perspective, when I'm looking at Saudi Arabia, obviously it's a quite different market, as you pointed out, it's a largely indigenous market. Uh, um, uh, but I also see what they seem to be doing is trying to make it a more attractive place to live in terms of whether that's schooling or whether that's things to do um, in terms of things like entertainment and cinemas and eating out and so on. Um, is that part of the approach? Is that is that is that is that what they are doing, or am I? seeing things wrong that that's a great question the answer is yes but again focused on the indigenous population mm -hmm. so another dynamic that we have to talk about in saudi arabia is the religious cultural dynamic up until four up until 2019 women couldn't drive mm -hmm. just to give you an idea right four or five years ago cinemas weren't allowed so you know while dubai has and the other gcc countries bahrain oman specifically have opened up uh i think a lot earlier saudi remained a closed environment so when you see all these entertainment projects launched in Saudi Arabia, do not think that they are launched based on the Dubai business model of, you know, 100 million tourists are going to come to Saudi Arabia in the next 10 years. It's not going to happen. Dubai already has that market. I mean, if you want, if you want to go on vacation, uh, there's better places than Saudi Arabia. The issue is, is that there's indigenous demand for that entertainment. You have a huge population, 10 to 15 times, for example, uh, Qatar. And there was nothing built for years. And so literally a country of 25 million that had zero cinemas. I mean, it's imagine the amount of cinemas that have to be built. So I think that that's the story that, you know, from an investment and development perspective, people need to understand if you're going to enter the Saudi market, uh, in my opinion, you really need to focus first on the indigenous captive demand. And it's those projects that will be successful. Uh, it's not the project which is going to have some wow factor and attract, you know, international and, you know, foreign expert. Dubai has already done that. Abu Dhabi is already doing that. The UAE has that sort of, you know, market pretty much wrapped up. The indigenous demand is what is driving the situation in Saudi, and that is how the development needs to meet the market demand. 
Thank you, and and but um, and Faisal, but the 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 Giga project program, the the Red Sea tourism project, the Amalas, the Aulas, the Neoms, of course, five hundred billion dollars. Uh, there is there is going to be some element of foreign investment and and non-Saudi national residential residential element to that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that that is that is our understanding is that those projects are being put together in a way that is designed to attract an international investor. But as Kabe said, I think first and foremost we need to look at what the what the indigenous population wants. And um, one of the interesting things that we've been looking at recently are um, are some potential emerging affordability issues. Now I know the uh, the data points I quoted earlier suggested that you know apartment values in in Riyadh are up eight percent year on year, but when we start looking at the performance of villas, um, it's quite a different story, uh, and that is echoed across the kingdom. Um, we've actually taken a look at uh, house price to household income ratios um, in Riyadh and Jeddah, and um, if you look at uh, the price of an apartment, you know, a, a pretty standard apartment in, in Riyadh on average, that would set you back about six to 800,000 rials. Um, and that means uh, that would equate to about, say, three or four times your annual income. Um, in Jeddah, it's slightly more expensive between 700 and 900,000 rials, and that puts you at about four and a half, five times your annual income. Uh, but when it comes to villas uh, in Riyadh, on average, they cost 2.2 million rials. And that means it costs you about nine times your annual income. And in Jeddah, they cost nearer 3 million rials, which means it's worth about 12 and a half times your annual income. Now, a globally accepted average for affordability is usually four to six times your annual income. Um, and indeed, when you go out to a bank to secure a mortgage, that's probably the best you can hope to get is four or five times annual incomes. Um, so it does look like there are a few places where we've breached those affordability thresholds. Um, I guess the bigger question is what proportion of the population can afford some of the projects that are being planned? I mean, some of the, the ticket prices being touted for the giga projects are a million dollars and upwards. Um, and the question is, what, uh, you know, what proportion of the population can afford that? And if every giga project is, is targeting the same segment of the population, you know, does that then raise questions about a potential oversupply in the future at the very top end of the market if we are unable to draw in international investors in the quantum that is expected and being forecast? Um, so I think for, for us, that's a quite quite an interesting dynamic. And I know Kabe has um, some views on this as well. Yeah, 100 percent. Just to echo what Faisal said. So, you know, the the it's easy to plan a project and just speaking from the client side i've worked for developers my whole life and the board comes to you and says this will attract international investment okay but let's take a look at the reality there is no freehold property law in saudi arabia i mean just the most basic thing there is no uh, there's no equivalent of the dubai land department there's no real estate regulatory agency there's no investor protection uh, documents are in Arabic, not in English. I mean, for, for Saudi to reasonably be able to attract the level of foreign investment that they're talking about from a property ownership perspective, it's years and years and years away. And it would require a fundamental transformation of how, you know, uh, everything does business. Having said that, for example, uh, one of the Giga Projects, Kadia, is building a Six Flags theme park. Now, if you can imagine, this is a country, again, 25, probably according to 30 million population, with no theme parks in it ever. You don't even need foreigners to come in. And the, 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 the other issue is you already have a huge amount of foreigners coming in. They're called religious pilgrims, right? Because of the city of Mecca, you have a projection of 30 million Muslims coming into the kingdom by 2030. So when we say international, we're really talking about uh, the MENA region, uh, the international Muslim population, to, to reasonably expect that Saudi Arabia, even within Neon, will ever be able to rival Dubai's situation with primarily Western expats and sort of East Asia and Western facing, it's quite unlikely. The point is they don't even need that because there is such a huge indigenous demand. And then there's also a demand from the surrounding uh, you know, region in terms of those that want a more religious and cultural tourist experience. And that's why the projects such as Alula, for example, are very interesting to re-gate. Um, you know, uh, 
I, I will be realistic to the people on the call. We went through this in Dubai 2006. As Faisal said, there will be an oversupply. The ambitious development program that will start, they're, they're, they're going through the same thing. They're making the same mistakes, unfortunately. And there will be an oversupply. But the projects that will work are the ones that are intelligently planned and designed and actual market facing uh, projects and really focus on what the, the, the USP is of the Saudi Arabian market, which is indigenous demand, cultural and religious tourism. And those projects will succeed and they will succeed greatly. Just uh, yeah. just to pick up on Sorry. what Kabe was saying there, Ed, just, uh, in, you know, the flip side of it and, and the silver lining, I guess, of all of this is that herein lies probably, you know, the best opportunity the kingdom has is to cater to an institutional investor. You know, that is something the region has really struggled with. You know, even Dubai, in, in 25 years of building what they've done, we haven't really been able to capture the global institutional investor. So if Saudi gets the regulations right, if they deliver the correct type of product, you know, suddenly Saudi has a chance to steal a march on the regional competition and attract those institutional funds that, that the kingdom is seeking. Because we've, as I say, we've really not seen them active in the region uh, to date. And, you know, going going back to Kaveh's point, uh, the reality of, of things is between Cairo and Mumbai, the only global hub we've got is Dubai. Um, so there is definitely room for, for more than one hub in the region, whether that's Riyadh or Neom or whatever it is, uh, each city needs to complement the other. You know, it's not a case of regional rivalry. It works like that for cities like Paris, Frankfurt and London. Uh, New York, Boston, Chicago, Toronto, or Singapore, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. They all complement one another. And we've actually taken a look at this to see how these cities perform in terms of employment, GDP growth, and about 100 other KPIs. And they all actually complement each other. They're not competing. In fact, for most of these cities, the top inbound and outbound source destinations for tourists tends to be within an hour's flying time. So to have, you know, another mega hub in the region would be terrific for everyone. Yeah. You don't necessarily need to compete with Dubai. You can you can work together. Precisely. Yeah. That's a very interesting point that uh, that you make. Um, so, but in order to say, for example, going back to your first point about attracting institutional investors, um, Carl was saying, you know, the rec there's a lack of regulations in some areas. Um, you know, rules around foreign ownership of, of property and real estate in general, more, you know, mortgage regulations and so on. What needs to what needs to be introduced or changed to to spur or to to give a little bit more impetus to 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 investment in that in the real estate market in the kingdom? Tavi, I don't know if you want to try and feel that one. Well, there's Idea. a couple of things. Yeah. I mean, there's, there, there's, I think it's going to happen in, in two phases. Uh, you know, one advantage of Dubai was that it's a relatively small market. I mean, just from a land area perspective, population. So uh, it's also very centralized. So the regulation can be rolled out quickly. I think what's going to happen, and, and the, the signs are there, that Saudi will start with what they call, you know, special economic zones or special zones. They will parcel out these giga projects and they will bring to market more modern regulations that attract foreign investors and the needed sort of base economy to be able to do a foreign investment institutional transaction in those limited areas. And they will start with that and fast track that. And then over the period of 10 to 15 years, you will see it come into the, to the overall economy. Because to be honest, the, the, the only sort of institutional grade development quality that's coming to market is really in the giga projects anyway. So I think that's one way around it. It still would take a few years, but it's not going to take 10 or 20 years as it would in the rest of the, in the, rest of the world. I think the other critical issue is that you know, if the institutional foreign investors are willing uh, to take more of a JV role, right and to really work with established local partners which are semi-government in nature uh then the door is already open so there are ways to get around it uh and i think that you're first going to see the entrance of you know uh, the foreign institutional investor from a jv perspective you're then going to see it within these special economic zones or specific areas that are created with with new rules regulations there'll, there'll be some teething some growing pains and then eventually in the future you will see sort of the mass market uh, open up. And just one other issue I think that Faisal was very correct about. The, one of the main reasons we've had 
a lot of trouble attracting institutional investment here in Dubai because we have all the baseline there. It's scale, right? There's just not enough of a scale. And in Saudi, the scale is there. I mean, if you're talking about a public-private partnership, for example, for an electricity grid, right? You take one giga project, there's enough there for, for an institutional investor to meet their, their, their financial targets the next 30 years. You have to wrap up the entire you know, emirate of Dubai into one project to, to achieve that scale. So the scale is so much bigger in Saudi as compared to the other Gulf projects that you know, I think that will really also attract the institutional foreign investors because you can achieve that, that quantum that, you're, that you really need to justify your investment. Yeah, and talking about that just, scale, we saw earlier in the sorry, presentation. Yeah, just, um, sorry, Sorry, I was just going to say on uh, on Kaveh's point, one, one final thing. I think uh, one of the sort of quick wins uh, for the kingdom will be around sustainability. And I know Kaveh uh, is probably sick of me talking about uh, sustainability, but um, I think, you know, with, with Saudi announcing that they're going carbon neutral by 2060 um, and factoring other issues such as rising inflation, the rising cost of construction materials and equipment, and the fact that some of these projects are pretty remote uh, from the nearest established city to get, you know, transport material workers to these areas is difficult. And I think um, from an institutional perspective, we know globally investors are ditching brown assets for greener ones. They are hunting for these assets actively around the world. And, you know, I'm not saying using modern methods of construction like 3D printing or modular housing is going to solve all of these issues. But in combination with traditional construction methods, you suddenly have a very attractive institutional grade product that will attract the institutional investors to your market. And at the same time, it makes the development more carbon neutral. It means the development is more financially viable because it's hard to get goods and workers to these areas. And like I said before, I think therein lies one of the biggest opportunities for Saudi to leapfrog all of its regional peers. Yeah, yeah. And certainly if you're looking at the Giga Projects program uh, and the sustainability is right at the very top in terms of how things are built and, uh, and in terms of the carbon footprint as well, certainly. Um, I've got a question here um, I'll, I'll, I'll put to, to both of you, whoever wishes to, to answer. Um, given the size of the big project program uh, in the kingdom, um, there's, there's obviously going to be an impact on the construction. How important are the giga projects for stimulating growth and opportunities in the regional, in the local and regional economy uh, in Saudi Arabia? I mean, we're talking about obviously indigenous other, and other projects, projects for local population, some of these giga projects. So how, how important are they for, for the kingdom? I mean, I, I, Kaveh, if you don't mind, I'll go first, and I'm sure you can. You've got some thoughts on this as well. But I mean, the the answer is in the question. It, it's exceptionally important uh, what's going on right now. Uh, you know, as as you mentioned earlier, we're we're tracking ourselves about 900 billion dollars worth of real estate and infrastructure projects that have been announced since the National Transformation Plan was unveiled in 2016. Um, uh, you know, on the West Coast alone, I think the total is close to $600 billion worth of projects. NEOM's got about $500 billion worth of that total. Um, and, you know, the, the, in, in sentiment-driven markets like the Middle East, creating that sort of ambition and setting the bar so high and trying to educate and upskill the indigenous population, you know, it's, it's priceless. Um, so what's going on there, the, the skills and training that the, that the population is picking up through these giga projects, you know, you really cannot put a price on it. Um, so in terms of economic benefit, uh, as I said to you, the, the positive sentiment that's percolating through the economy is reflected in all the latest KPIs. It's reflected in the fact, you know, I ran through some of those data points earlier. Employment was basically untouched through the course of the pandemic, whereas, you know, globally, more, more advanced economies were decimated and have struggled to come back out of the pandemic. Whereas where Saudi, uh, you know, remained pretty stable and uh, now that things have started to improve, we're seeing economic growth starting to accelerate. In fact, next year, the, the forecast from the IMF is for 5% growth. Um, and across the MENA region, the average is 4%. Um, so Saudi already starting to outperform, you know, not just the GCC, but the, but the wider MENA region as well. Yeah, if I could just add, 
if I could just add to that, look, I think if someone asked me what is the major difference just from a macroeconomic perspective between the GCC and Western Europe or the United States where I'm from, very simply is that here everything is government led and essentially everything is private sector led uh, in the more developed markets. Uh, it's historically been like that in the Gulf and what ends up happening is the government brings to market a massive program and there's a trickle down effect into the private sector. Without that government spur, none of what has been achieved or is going to be achieved would be possible. So it's it's not only I wouldn't even say it's the you know it's important. I would say it's the it's the it's the linchpin to the entire uh, you know the entire situation here. And that's not just true of Saudi; it's true of UAE as well, but especially Saudi Arabia, given uh, the scale of what they're trying to develop. Completely agree. Okay, so just last one last question, really. Um, just as, as we're running out of time, but I just wanted to touch on the, the commercial uh, real estate side. Uh, you know, and I certainly know in Dubai there's a bit of an oversupply of commercial space, um, as far as, as as far as I can tell. Uh, what's the situation like in uh, in uh, in the kingdom in the various major cities? Is there also an oversupply, or is there a lack of, a lack of good quality office space? Um, so I'll, I'll kick that one off. Uh, so the, uh, the, the answer is, uh, is, is there's a lack of good quality space in some locations. So if we look at uh, Riyadh, for example, grade A rents are up about one and a half to two percent in the last 12 months, whereas grade B rents have declined by that same amount, one and a half to two percent. And yeah. this isn't a unique, you know, this, this phenomenon isn't unique to, to Riyadh or Saudi or the region. It's a global phenomenon. We all know that the pandemic has forced a rethink in occupational strategies. Businesses are you know, thinking about factoring greater remote working in the future, looking at hybrid working models. Um, and the reality is that a lot of this stems from before COVID even started. Uh, businesses were focused on best in class grade A space as a way to mitigate around challenges of securing and attracting the best people to work for them. Um, and the way they were doing that was by taking grade A space, because we all want an amazing office to work in, especially post COVID. We want to know our safety and security is looked after, our workplace well-being is looked after, and increasingly, all the boxes for environmental, social and governance issues need to be ticked. Um, and so going forward, we expect to see businesses actively focused on the best space that they can afford. Um, and as I said before, institutions are tra chasing those greener assets. So whilst you might not get a small company that's after 100 square meters, you know, questioning the environmental accreditation of the building, developers will have to deliver that product if they're looking to attract institutional investors. Um, and so, you know, to answer your question uh, quickly, um, we expect that disparity in performance of grade A and grade B rents to continue widening. Um, and, you know, that raises all sorts of questions around what's going to happen to grade B stock, not just in Saudi, but but around the world. You know, do we have increased voids? Do we have a change of use? Do we have demolition? But again, you know, just to identify the silver lining there in refurbishing or renovating a grade B building, you actually have a lower carbon footprint than if you rebuild the building or you demolish it and build a new one in its place. Um, so again, from an investor's perspective, when the question is asked, what's your carbon footprint? It's actually lower if you refurb. Um, so it's not all bad news for, for grade B stock. Thank you. Yeah, Can and I think just to, follow, yeah, just to follow on what Faisal said from a sort of development trend perspective, I think the critical thing to understand about, about Saudi is that it's on a hyper modernization curve. But what was built previously really does not do justice to calling it even modern. I mean, the, the, the stock of what's there right now is, is almost third world in nature. And so, you know, the trick is to stay just ahead of the market. Yeah. You don't want to bring something to market that is five steps ahead. You have to continuously just go one because then you're, 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 you're bringing something so sophisticated that the market won't even understand it. Right. So you need to stay one or two steps ahead of the market as the market modernizes over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, I think that given the status of the existing stock, and this is true for almost all asset classes, um, they are going to be obsolete 
in the new order of Saudi Arabia, assuming this national, national transformation is executed. What's going to happen to that stock? No, nobody knows. Probably the majority of it will have to be demolished. So I think, you know, to, to just look at the raw numbers and say, well, this is oversupplied or undersupplied, it's, uh, it, it doesn't work in, in such a rapidly transforming market such as Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, this enormous amount of residential development, for example, that's happening is largely based on the fact that the existing residential supply is, is so poor in certain uh, segments that just by bringing to market something that in, let's say, Dubai would be considered mid-market is luxury in Saudi Arabia. And as the population is changing, more educated, you know, more modernized, let's say, lower household sizes, et cetera. So I think what we really need to understand is that the country itself is transforming from something between, let's say, you know, emerging and developing to a developed economy. Riding that wave is going to be the critical development trend. The developers that are going to make money are the ones that are going to be able to ride that wave and continuously bring a higher and higher standard to market. Not too far ahead of the market, but a couple steps ahead. And then three years later, a couple steps ahead and then a couple steps ahead. And in this way, consistently, you will be pulling the market along with you as you bring more modern typologies to the market. I think that's really the, the secret sauce. And, and if the Giga projects, uh, you know, do that, then the private sector can follow that same strategy. And I think that would make it a huge success. Very interesting. Yes. Um, and lots of food for thought there. Well, um, thank you, uh, Kabe. Thank you, Faisal. I think we've uh, run out of time. I do notice there's a few questions here about if the... The, re the recording will be available, and I believe it will be on the uh, Big Five Saudi uh, website. Um, and you'll be able to listen again to the comments today, as well as see the um, go through the presentation again. Uh, but that, all that leads me to do is say thank you so much to Faisal Durrani and Kara Samsami from um, Knight Frank uh, for giving up your time today to, to answer my questions and those of the audience. Uh, it's been really stimulating, really interesting and insightful. And I felt, I hope that everyone who listened in today uh, we've got a lot out of it and uh, came out much better informed on the, the situation in Saudi Arabia and some of the opportunities that are emerging there. Uh, but otherwise, that just leaves me to say thank you very much uh, for attending today. And um, I look forward to um, future webinars and um, to hopefully speaking and meeting with you all very soon. Thank you once again and have a Thanks, very sir. good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.